here this afternoon, the last part of the last session of the conference in Mathematical Way, Miami. And it is a pleasure to introduce the winner of the Crucial uh, American Prize for Research in Mathematics for a young investigator, uh, Miguel Walsh from the University of Buenos Aires. He's going to be speaking about the uniformity of the multiplicative problems. Okay, so I wanted to talk about some work I did last year regarding fully uniformity of multiplicative functions. And so basically, this uh, problem is both more or less as follows. Well. So looking at a multiplicative function for a large interval, as I say. And we choose randomly a small interval, such that we and we restrict our multiplicative function to that small interval. The question is can we guarantee that almost surely? This description has no large Fourier That's the main question. So I will tell you about this question and I will also explain how this connects to some central questions about the behavior of multiplicative functions. And in turn, how this connects to some fundamental questions about arithmetic objects like the distribution of prime. So let's begin. So the problems and the result we will discuss will concern, as I said, general multiplicative functions. So let us recall the definition. Multiplicative function, function of g from natural numbers to the complex numbers, such that g of n times n is equal to g of n times g of n whenever n and n are both prime. So it's a basic definition of multiplicative function. The law of infinite multiplicative functions all around mathematics. And while the results that I will discuss apply to general multiplicative functions, and I will tell you more precisely how this works later. I will, however, mostly for greatness and due to its central role, focus on the limit function, which is one of the central functions in that. So, again, there are many interesting functions. The results will apply in general, but we will focus on this particular case. So, let us start by recalling the definition of the limit function. So, the limit function of lambda. It's a function that goes from natural numbers from natural numbers to this to the power, either minus one to one. And it's defined as lambda of n is equal to minus one. It then has a normal number of prime factors, and lambda of n is equal to one other. It's a very simple definition of this function, which is nevertheless fundamental. So sum is fine, lambda of one is equal to one, lambda of two is equal to minus one. Lambda of three is equal to minus one, then a lambda of p will be equal to minus one plus minus one p, and then lambda of four is equal to one because we use the old prime divide for but it divides it twice. And you may notice from the definition that lambda is indeed completely repeated. So lambda of n times n is equal to lambda of n times lambda of n for every choice of natural numbers and then they don't need to be for prime, so we can to the so it's a little bit. Uh, better property than general multiplicative functions. We can practice that and change that, but it's technically complete. So, this is a little function, and it's an absolutely fundamental function in number theory. One of the reasons for this is because it's a classical fact that the behavior of this function is intimately tied to the behavior of prime numbers. So, it's, if you can get understand the statistical properties of this function, then you can also understand the properties of prime numbers. And the most famous example of this is the ring hypothesis, which tells us in one of its many equivalent formulations that for any epsilon greater than zero, we can find some constant c of epsilon, and an epsilon such that the particle sums, the absolute value of the particle sum of the single function from one to x is bounded by this constant times x to one half plus epsilon. This is equal for every positive x and for every epsilon greater than zero. That's probably one of the easiest ways to form this. And of course, this is also equivalent to the ring hypothesis, just getting a good estimate on the number of primes of size and most x. So there is a very direct connection there, and estimating part of some of the real part of the x. And from this, we can obtain some conclusion. First of all, it's not that easy to say the things we want to say about the real function. But on the other hand, it's really an interesting function to study. A lot of mathematics is evidently in positive sense behavior of this function. 
Now, usually these things are phrased in terms of the Moebius function, which is the sibling of the new function. The Moebius function is the function that is equal to the new function when n is a square root, so when there is no perfect square dividing n, and it's equal to zero otherwise. And actually, the Moebius function is the one that writes naturally in mathematics, for example, as the inverse of the density and the binary convolution, or it's the same thing as the coefficients of the difficult series of the inverse of the density function. But the legal function is what has been used uh, lately because it's slightly more convenient technically. The legal function is completely multiplicative, or the point function is just multiplicative. And it takes uh, just two values, minus one and one, but then the function has to set only to hold the value of zero, which in order to explain the point function is confusing. But it's not that fundamental issue. And anything that we can put about the legal function, we can put about the modulus function, and that's the best part. So it's good. They're essentially equivalent to start So we'll call the legal function to start. And one last thing you may notice is that this is exactly the kind of value we would expect to have if we were dealing with a function that took its two values, one and minus one, each with randomly, each with probability one. Okay, if you just like toss a coin to decide whether the value is one or minus one, you should expect to get an hour. So the Riemann hypothesis predicts that a usual function, in this sense, becomes like a random function, and this random behavior will be a topic to our problem. But this is not the only important problem of prime numbers with which the usual function is connected. So, in fact, similarly, problems like all conjecture or different conjecture will follow from a sufficiently strong quantitative answer to the following very same conjecture challenge. Going back to the sixth. So, Charles' conjecture says that for every choice of these integers, h1 to hk, this expression here should go to zero. So it's essentially the self correlations of the new function. We look at the same integers and look at uh, the values of the new function multiplied by the different sheets. Right? It's very important. So it's actually bad, it's a wide open So what do I mean by a sufficiently strong function class? If one attacks these problems in the most naive way, you end up with expressions, with expressions that uh, are kind of like this multiplied by some additional factors. And these additional factors are in principle simpler functions to understand. But the expectation is that one can actually control this expression, then one should also be able to control this more general expression because of the methods of the problems like scaling. But what do I mean by a sufficiently strong quantity answer? So if you look, the Riemann hypothesis predicts a very strong quantitative uh, estimate. Square root translation is essentially the optimal thing that one can expect. This, what we will need here, is actually much, much weaker. So it's not even a power set. We will need to show that the expression here, that's just ignore the limit, the expression that comes out ignore the limit, is bounded by a large power alone. So that's for example something that you do know for part of something. But if instead we were able to prove that same estimate for this correlation, where we are able to say a large power of lower in, in terms of the quantity bound, or rather weak. But if we were able to achieve one, we should be able to reduce this problem of static values or prime numbers. But of course, we don't even know that it's going to see. So we're not close to that. In fact, Charles Menchecker is one of those Menchecker's where for all the many decades that have been formulated, we haven't been able to say very much about it. Well, one of the things we can handle some cases or not, for example, that has been wide open. Now, even without speaking to the prime number, the challenge and check it is interesting from a basic arithmetic point of view. There are many constructors in number theory that have similar play, looking at self correlations of multiple defined <laughs> arithmetic functions. And basically, this goes uh, back to something that is a very simple and nevertheless uh, fundamental thing that is around number theory and that is connected to number theory, which would be like the tension between multiplicative and arithmetic structure. So, <clears throat> essentially, what this is saying is that multiplicative, multiplicative structure is lost when you apply each. So, for example, if you look at an integer n, then let, let's say we look at the simple case of this, we have two integers 0 and 1, so we're looking at this, we're looking at lambda of n times lambda of n. And the idea is that uh, the multiplicative information of, of n tells us nothing about the multiplicative information of n plus 1. Or concretely, if we know the value of the usual function of n, where it was 1 minus 1, 
that really doesn't tell us anything about the value of the unit function in plus one. It cannot. It doesn't allow us to predict the, the value of plus one. And in general, the same. And this is again another manifestation of this sort of random behavior function. The value at one point is kind of independent of the value of plus one. If I want to stay from the value. It's not so. And so, indeed, the evil function is expected to behave similarly <laughs> in the sense that statistical properties should be similar to those of a random function that takes either of these two values, one or minus one, each with probability one. Out. This is a general expectation of the tablet, as we saw, we apply in a quantity that is with strong answer, when by both problems like a twin transfer check or the ring hypothesis with different formulations. But it's something that the post don't know that much about. So what do I mean by zero random? So the usual function is defined deterministically, the natural definition of the function. So I can cheat and look at special statistical properties that actually look at how it's defined. So based on how it's defined, shows that in that in a particular sense that we behave as a random function. But the idea is that as long as you look at as you're as long as you're not cheating, just uh, look at statistics that have nothing to do with the way the function is defined, then those statistics will be the same. So it's a random function that takes. These two values we probably don't have. And this leads to something that is another heuristic principle, but it's a fundamental in this area, which is that we expect sums of this form to exceed cancellation. So we expect that if we sum the legal function times some function f, with f being either a simple or a deterministic function, then these things should exceed uh, cancellation. Now, the question is, what do we mean by simple or deterministic? And the answer is that we don't really know. The idea of this principle is, which is a very useful principle, is as follows. Again, you're expecting some problem with number theory, and you end up with the expression of this. Now, as long as f is not actually, you know, if it's a function that arises naturally in your problem, but it's not the usual function in disguise, as long as it's not actually the usual function, it's very, very close to it, then is to go with exceeding cancellation, then on that rise of naturally in your problem. Well, actually, this principle, although it's not very rigorous, is extremely important. Yeah. Analytic number theory in general, but in particular to the questions about prime numbers and emission. And the reason for this is that the main tool that we've had in the last hundred years to think about the problems about prime numbers, yeah. in particular the one that I before, is C theory. From a modern terminology, C theory is the following idea. We try to look at a simple function that kind of behaves like a characteristic function of prime. So prime numbers can be obtained by sifting problems. Very basic thing, just eliminate multiples of so smaller primes. But this actually same problem is very long. And well, the answer that I give is very complicated. That's the one you cannot be just given useful information about it. So, so the idea of C theory is to stop the same process early in the hope that you get something that is simple, but it's probably early, you only get a good computation, but it still approximates the prime. Now, the problem with this is an observation made by Selber in the 40s for a long time, which is that this can never work to solve the problems that you want to solve. Because if actually you could create a simple function that behaves more or less like a characteristic function of prime numbers. Then that function will be equal well, when n is a prime, will be equal to one essentially, of course, to one. And then and when n is prime, we know that the new function is minus one. So when n is prime, the term there will be equal to minus one plus one. Well, if n is not prime, since f should be an approximation of the characteristic function of the primes, f should be essentially zero, and then each term will be zero. So in conclusion, every single term here that is not zero will be minus one. There will be no cancellation of the function to the fact that we expect cancellation of the simple one. So this simple observation of Selbert showed that the C theory can never be succeed by itself in solving the problems that one has to solve. That nevertheless is not probable. Because there are some things that we can say about. So for example, if you instead of trying to approximate the prime numbers, you're talking about numbers that are the product of the most two prime numbers, you no longer have this problem. Because when n is prime, it will be equal to, will be equal to minus one. When n is the product of two primes, it's equal to one. And then in principle, there will be cancellation. You have both minus one and one. 
And in fact, it turns out that we can actually uh, show this. And that's why we can prove Terence theorem and stuff that are in the in prime physics, that people have two is the product of most two prime, but we cannot prove that there are things in the prime physics that people have two is prime. And essentially, by the same reason, we have two kind of sums with solve that there are, if there are some constant C's that are two things in the prime speed, that the people have C's all prime. Well, we cannot never specify the, the value of the side value of C because we want to try to do that in the case of C theory. In the end, we will be confident to take the twins to that letter C. On the other hand, if we can actually rigorously establish this principle, then we will combine that with C theory to be able to do it. Based on the desire to back then try to actually make this rigorous, Sarna put forward the following conjecture almost uh, 15 years ago, which, as I said, what he's trying to accomplish is to give us a rigorous version of that principle. So let me tell you what Sarna conjecture says, and then I'll tell you why it's interesting. So, our standard conjecture goes as follows take T, a continuous function of zero entropy and a compact metric space Y. Then, for every continuous function F and every choice of the uh, base point with one, with big one, we have that this expression now to go to zero. So, this is the correlation of the new function now is multiplied uh, with uh, F evaluated at each of the little one. So, what are we doing? We've got a space Y. And little point little uh, point little white side of it, we have some transformation of the space to itself. So we look at little white, apply T successively, so we get an orbit. And then we just evaluate F at each point of the zone. So that gives us a sequence of values. And the crucial assumption here is that we are assuming that T has zero and zero to follow the side. So loosely speaking, what does it mean for? Something to have zero entropy in this context is that we can essentially predict the end value of the sequence that we have constructed on long degree values. That's essentially what the concept of zero entropy tries to encapsulate that. If we know the preceding values, we have some little prediction about the next one. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the idea underlying all these conjectures that I mentioned is that actually the little function behaves randomly, the contrast to this, the, the contrast to this uh, prediction algorithm. So nothing that arises in this way should be able to use the dedicated in the part because it's the opposite of being around. And so in this way, Sarah's been shaping is a very elegant way to formulate this uh, principle that we have in the dynamic theory of the randomness of the modes of the new function. And that's one of the reasons why it's interesting. But it's also interesting from a practical point of view because since it's formulated in terms of dynamical systems, it's actually attracted a lot of people working in that area to start thinking about it. Huh. And as a consequence, a lot of tools in dynamical systems have to move <coughs> into the area, which is particularly useful because there is a lot of dynamical feeling to a lot of the behavior of the new function that we're trying to study in this process. That has been a good way to On the other hand, another reason why this is uh, interesting at a practical level is because there are a lot of zero entropy. And contrary to, for example, child conjecture, where we really don't, we can't say much about conjecture, we don't have particular cases that we can handle. We do have a lot of particular cases with certain conjecture which we can handle. So we have this, this allows us to have this nice spectral problem where, from what we can handle to which what we really don't have any idea, that allows us to isolate the, the difficulties and the different things that we have done. Really, very useful from a practical point of view. We have a problem that we really have no idea how to solve. To be able to figure out and sort of the bridge uh, to start approaching it little by little. And that's something that's going to be very So, zero entropy is only a sufficient thing? It's a necessary condition, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can one at least continue to play its boundaries? If you replace, if you start using mesh, then actually this becomes privileged. Because no, no, no. Yeah, it can go. because the, the problem lies in the set of the zero It's important that we have this full continuous uh, as well. And yeah. so one objection one may raise about this is that well there are, it's, it's nice that we have a lot of children for the system because of the same goal. But on the other hand, we really care about the zero system. Like if you look at the most exotic theoretical system that you can find, we really that really add up something number theoretically to know how the little function 
behaves against that particular system. And that leads to the last region I mentioned, perhaps the most important of why some state structure is, is very interesting and has been interesting study in the last 20 years, which is that actually child of conjecture implies farm essentials. So if you want to solve this question of the log prime number that I didn't mention it before, if you want to solve Java, or even if you just want to solve Java, it's interesting by itself, you have to solve some exception. So in a sense, if you want to solve this problem, you have to develop tools that are able to handle every single one of these systems. No system is uh, superfluous in this sense. And similarly to what I would say before, this is particularly interesting because, again, some exception is giving us uh, a lot of things to talk about to try to understand the things that we don't understand about the legal functions and the function. Now, as you may get from what I've been saying, both problems are connected to understanding the value patterns of the living. So what do I mean by this? Things are natural and other K, and we look at the K tuples of conservative values of the legal function. So we start with some integer yeah. And from there, we look at the values of the legal function of class one, class two, so on, and plus k. And we try to understand what sort of value patterns are right in this way. So the legal function takes two values, minus one and one. So there are at most two to the k possible value patterns that it can take. Now, Charles' conjecture would imply that the legal function is random in the sense that it, that it takes all of its two to the k possible k tuples of consecutive values, each with the same probability set. So child conjecture has its cost that uh, the legal function should take all of its patterns with essentially the same just like that. But to tell you how little we can we can know how the child allows the legal function, again, even though it's a function that we have studied for more than 100 years, is that until recently we didn't even know that this pattern will rule like the quadratic. We didn't even know that it would like k squared, even though it's basically two to the k to take all of the slides. So that's really the, the very bad situation in terms of our knowledge of this, even though this is not like a curiosity, the value pattern that I say is really somehow all part of the question now. So so far, I've been telling you problems about the legal function, and I will tell you one last one. So, that family problem, which are the uniform objectives, which is what I mentioned at the beginning of the problem. So, precisely the Fourier uniform objective of the legal function predicts the problem. So, take H, any function of X that goes to infinity as X goes to infinity. It doesn't matter how slow it is, this is the crucial point. H, a function of X, it goes to infinity as x goes to infinity, but can go as low as you can. And the problem will become harder the slower h grows. Then okay, this expression, the new expression should go to c. I'll give you a second to look at it, see what you doing. But again, it's a second shape about certain expression that goes to zero in the limit. So essentially about the cancellation in this expression. And so <clears throat> what we're looking at here is what I mentioned at the beginning. You're working with a multiplicative function, let's say the little function over a big interval of time x, and then we randomly choose a small interval of size h. So h is the size of the small interval, x is the big interval. So we randomly choose a small interval inside a big interval, and the question is, can we guarantee that almost sure if I restrict the little function to this interval, then that restriction has no large Fourier coefficient? So almost surely we'll look at that expression inside. And the interval this interval of then h starting with x, then even if I take the supremum of all exponential functions, the, 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 the correlation of the usual function, this exponential function goes to zero. You can take choosing that. Even if I choose a in each interval, the one with the exponential will be probably the most, I guess that all this goes to zero. This is a very strong statement. And one of the main motivations for this is that a basic combinatorial or analytic fact that if something that's not hard to be efficient, then in many sense, it behaves like a random function. So, this is saying that almost surely, if I look at a small interval, then from a Fourier analytic point of view, the little function behaves like a random function. Now, as I said, actually, all these things that I have in this cabinet apply not just for the little function, but for the general. So, let me just now tell you a bit how that works. 
So, for example, in the case of this conjecture, the probably uniform conjecture in general, that is that the same should be true for any bounded multiplicative function, so any multiplicative function, the complex numbers that have to the value of one. And this should hold for every such function as long as it is not of a very specific form. This should hold as long as G does not look like this specific multiplicative function that sends an integer n, positive integer n, to n to the entire where t is a small real number and t is a very good type of small model, which for the purposes of this model, it's a good thing that it's a really multiplicative function with small people. So both, this, this is the product of two basic uh, multiplicative functions, since the idea of the effect character, and both these are two fundamental kinds of multiplicative functions from the, the kind of way the multiplicative analog, the growth of uh, the exponential for the other thing, if you try to reduce more than that, you get this expression, one of the ideals of the other one. And the idea of the conjecture is that only this particular function would be counted as a fully important. In fact, it is very easy to see just in use as a tailored function that these are functions that do not satisfy the same that I gave before. But the idea is that as long as your multiplicative function does not look like one of these functions, then it should satisfy the same case in it that I gave you for you function. And such functions that do not look like these ones are called non-pretentious multiplicative functions. This is a terminology on the program and some version from the years ago that Become very prominent in the area. And it's the idea that they don't pretend to this, this particular function. So, so, one comment what do I mean by look like? Well, the conjecture fails for this into the type of function. But obviously, if I just modify the value of the function at one prime, then I still get essentially the same function. So, I still get a function sample to explain. But it's essentially the same function. So, the idea that it doesn't look like it's not there. It's not very close to the value of the most parts. So those are the problems, and the, the result of the conjecture to hold in general when it's only just And in fact, all the conjectures that we have been discussing, except for the real hypothesis, are expected to hold under an assumption of this. The only difference is that depending on the specific problem of being they change for the value of t is about to be a character. So, and one last comment about this uniform conjecture is that the full uniform conjecture, which is the most common conjecture, predicts that one should be able to have the same result if instead of taking the suprema, as we have done before, over just the exponential, we increase the space for functions with the correlation and we consider all you know, sequences of values. So, two things about the sequences, they are very just brief ideas, but for the rest of the what are the sequences of what we have? So, the sequences are things that arise in the same way as what you call the which are things that have some origins in space and you're going to have them in space. But there are no sequences because that space is a very specific form of the origin of the modal group by a spherical box. So, you have a flow that arises out of, and the, and the action in that space is multiplication by a vector. So, state flows that arise. In the way of the sum of the that are what space is supposed to be supposed to be by the scripts of all sample and the action multiplication by an energy group, those things are essentially what are no sequences. And why do we care about them? Why, why we have this uniform conjecture? Is that this is something that goes back to the work of Gowers, Severe's theorem, Foster and Pratt, and Sinder, Collinsky, and Penningley, and then they like Ben Tau, which is this beautiful phenomenon that essentially goes as follows. If I look at the Bounded function, any bounded uh, function to the complex number, from the number to the complex number, and I look at how it behaves with respect to independent linear forms. So I look at this function with respect to independent linear forms. Then it turns out that the only way that the statistics that a function has with respect to linear forms, the only way that this does not coincide with the statistics of a random function, is if in some way there is an insequence in this guy. So the only way that a uh, bound function can have abnormal behavior with respect to the forms is if it correlates with some sequence. And this is really beautiful because th this kind of statistic just the behavior with respect to the forms is a really fundamental thing about something like parts of 
And we have a very concise and elegant explanation of, of, of this behavior. So, you know, usually, it's very hard to show that something behaves randomly. And the nice thing about this is that it, it, we have actual reasons why it cannot be the So, explain what that means. Whether so it behaves randomly or it has a very specific structure, which is obviously extremely weak. So, that's why we care about this more general uniform relationship. Because then we will be able to guarantee that almost surely in a small interval, the usual function is very nicely with respect to the uniform. So, what is the point? But in the stuff, which I'll focus on the Fourier uniform conjecture, well, simplicity, but also because it is largely expected that any proof of this particular so should extend the percentage of the to deal with the general behavior of the thing. So, when it's noted that this one importance in the sequences originally arise, there was a lot of work trying to extend the sum of the uniform. But by, by now we have a good machinery to do that. It's not an easy thing to carry out, but we have the machinery to do it. So, what we really don't know how to do is how to deal with small interval. So, if we're able to study exponential functions in small interval in the standard, then we believe that we have the energy to see how to extend and resolve from the sequences, and that's a reason to focus on the story of the more function. <clears throat> And the rather remarkable fact is that all these problems that I have been telling you about, Charles and Shepard, Thomas and Shepard, and Uniformity and Shepard, are essentially equivalent to three. So, precisely what's shown by Tau for the following states, by the way. So, what sense are they almost to prove? Or essentially prove? Well, what he does is instead consider this logarithmically weighted form of Charles and Shepard. So, it's, it's the same statement that we have at the beginning of Charles and Shepard. So, we take some distinct integer h1 to hk. We look at the self correlation so the new function, but now the change that we do is that we add a weight one to n. So we pay less attention to large integers and we more attention to small integers. <laughs> and since the sum of one over n as the x is small, it's not for x, the right one might say it maybe it's too right. So we get this value of the problem. Now, taking this sort of weights is actually a natural way to take it as a law. Historical results that in terms of this form, and it has a reason that it both give you to a series and then for the old conceptual reason is that this kind of words phase out a little bit in terms of attributed characters. And so it's a relatively <coughs> natural thing to study in an ideal number theory. And the wonderful observation that that, that, that tell me is that this thing not only implies the corresponding statement of the sound of the but actually it's the equivalent thing. So that weighted version of the challenge of the is actually equivalent to so doing exactly the same thing to sound of the So we have the same statements in sound of the that some confused functions here in the of the space, the same, exactly the same hypothesis. And at the end, we look at the same expression, the expression lambda of n times f of t of n bar. We have a weight one over n, it's normalized one, one over the log x. Now we get something that is actually equivalent to <coughs> Charles and Shetty. And not only that, it is also equivalent to doing the same thing to the uniform function. <coughs> so, yeah. same hypothesis, maybe any function of x that goes to infinity, arbitrary is slowly, but it might have to Then look at the situation we had before, and again now divide by u. So, in the cancel. And similarly to replace the financial skills with sequences of parent indexes. So again, it will be the same that if I look at the randomly chosen small interval, I have cancellation, but now the, the distribution I'm using is given by all And so this is a, a really wonderful thing because these are three problems that have a history of their own and kind of depend on different classical narrations and this number theory, and they all turn out to be essentially equivalent to each other. All these three problems. Charles and Shepard is the most classical of them, but then the correlation with the little function of exponential for time, at least the work of more than 80 years ago, has some history and the study of multiplicative functions on close has been prominent in the last couple of decades. And it's all these things converge into this equivalent statement. So they're really pointing out the fact that there is this fundamental property of the little function that explains all these things to be evidence. It's the way it makes it weaker, it doesn't figure that. Yeah. 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 Right. So the, the original thing is only by this way to form the other thing. The other thing is not true. But, uh, maybe, 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 maybe
and like now we have everything to say, but uh, it's not that hard. Like the tools are what you need are not that big. And one last nice property of this last version is that we don't need to prove it for arbitrary small things. So what we realize later by work of the mathematics, Crafty will tell Garabayan and Siglin that in fact, if we could prove this for this specific choice of edge, so if for every epsilon we can prove it when a is equal to log x to the epsilon, then this actually will imply the statement for an arbitrary choice of edge that goes to the thing, and then it will imply the arbitrary statements as well. So we only need to prove it in this range, which is good because what is really hard in the kind of theory is to deal with very, very small things. This is still very small. It's not from the number theory, but at least it's not arbitrary. Now, if I was giving this talk 10 years ago to an expert in the area, they would say, well, this is all nice and well. The neck and all these things are equivalent, but what's the point? Because you have absolutely no idea what that is in this And that would have been true for one year. Because nine years ago, Mathematic and Rational came with this. Really beautiful result. So they put the following statements. Take H, the function of X that goes to infinity, X goes to infinity, it doesn't matter how slowly. Then this expression goes to C. So yeah, what we're looking here is we look at the again a randomly chosen small interval of size H inside the big interval of size Dx. And then almost surely we can guarantee that the partial assumption of little function in this interval. And so this goes to zero. And this is an absolutely fantastic piece because there, is, there was really no precedent of any results in analytic number theory that was able to deal with arbitrary small input. In fact, any claim of this format will say that we will have been taking more standard theory than actual mathematical thing to be able to deal with arbitrarily small input. <laughs> Usually in the theory, of years, theory is something like an interval of size like x to the Two thirds, that's a small. Now it's huge. So we can do logics, log the logics, and what. So it's a big, it's a really, really big uh, break. And in fact, not only they show this, they show that a similar claim holds for general non pretentious functions. In the definition I gave you before, as long as I have a thousand of the better function that doesn't look like n to the it kind of the then you have a similar thing. But you have a lot of information. This does not apply directly to, to the problems I've been discussing. Uh, a big simplification of why it doesn't apply it has to do with what I mentioned before about this. Uh, the underlying idea in this problems is this sort of independence between multiplication the properties and additive generation. <coughs> and this in result actually comes, so to speak, from that perspective and talent from the multiplicative multiplicative side. So it's really the most the multiplicative properties used in a very essential way. And for example, the uniform conjecture, we want to study a, a problem like this where we now twist it by an exponential. It means like a little function like an exponential. Once we do that, we lose the multiplicative strap, and I thought we lose all the tools that allow to do this itself. So there's really no way that we know to in any way adapt the methods that allow to completely do the things that may be close, but are no longer multiplicative. So in that sense, you can't apply this to the problem. But we now know something when we understand things with more so we know something very substantial. We know that we have cancellation for general multiplicative function. So it really opens the way and makes it not unreasonable to actually try to understand these problems. So it's a huge change of the last. So <clears throat> then you now in the last part of the talk tell you what we do know about these problems. So let me tell you about two results that I uh, managed from last year. That will, I think, give a good idea of what understanding these problems. So let's see the assumption to be large constant. And then the first result is that the whole uniformity conjecture holds as long as H grows as H plus X. Precisely grows like this expression here, which was very tiny to the law, which is pretty hard. So as long as h is has this size, so it's the measure of the size of h rule, then we can prove the full uniform h. And here with many uh, as with many things in this area, it's important to clarify whether the bound is significant or not. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is actually a very natural part of the problem and for other related problems as well. And it's there so much so that there are many ways to try to explain all of them. Not very simple, but the animal was trying to explain why it's a natural problem. And they more or less have to do with the fact that in all these problems, on one side of things in a small interval, one uses the multiplicativity to relate what happens in one interval with what happens in another. Now, the smaller the intervals are, they actually have the behavior of a smaller one. And in fact, since what you want to do is hang with the all the to each other, the smaller the intervals are, the more iterations you need to do to the relate all the so if at each time that you're iterating, it has any kind of a loss of factor in bounds that you get, it's exactly here for those who are accumulating that are so big that they have to be So in fact, even before this time was established, it was known that this will be a natural limit because essentially almost everything that we know about this problem. The methods would have this problem break down here. But actually, some things broke down before. So there's a particular thing that is relevant for. Or which is that the, in the, the original result of this system of the that, where they show that this holds on each block like x to the s. Now, for that, the, uh, the crucial ingredient is to be able to have cancellation in exponential sums of the primes. And such cancellation is only known in when the intervals are bigger than e to the, the log x to the two thirds. So it's pretty to e to the log x to some power on this side. And e to the log x to the two thirds is the best range that we have balanced for exponential sums of the practice. And this is something that nobody has been able to invent. Certainly more than 50 years. And this not in a substantial way. And it's, it comes from the best sum that we have in the prime number here. And so it was a problem because that was a crucial part of the method. That had to be resolved in order to move forward. But they managed to they realize in, in the subsequent world with Terra and Ziegler that you only need an average form of this calculation of exponential sums that holds in e to the log x to the pi eight. So they managed to establish that in the frame. But as it turns out, and we got a nice bit result, there's uh, an alternative approach that actually shows that at least in this range, it's not really necessary to use And in fact, the, the approach is simpler in many ways. And it allows you to reach this, which, as I mentioned, is something that was known to be an athlete for the problem. In fact, I mentioned that uh, we don't need to prove this. This, this is for the full indicator for the free function check and not the weight damage person, the full person. But for the equivalent problems that I mentioned, we only need to prove this for the interval of size of the to the We don't need to prove it for other response, but it suffice to build things of that size. And, and in fact, there have now been some developments in the methods that tell you how far you need to go. And in principle, conceptually, this is also the limit of how far you can go from the for the figure is the limit of how much you can go from above. You have to the prove itself. And it's also the limit of how much okay, conceptually you can prove it. It's not really how much you need, how, how, how low you need to get to, to, to solve the problems that I mentioned before. So this is right at the limit. So the idea is that if you could actually get a substantial improvement to this, say prove it for uh, two bits and even below one half, then there's a good chance that that already encapsulates the real multiple bit problem. So that we can change. And maybe that uh, explains why the, the second result is, uh, is even deeper than this result, which is that in fact, assuming the general improvement hypothesis we can actually break. This was a problem. And in fact, we can break it uh, rather substantially and show that the poor living form is actually holds for a large power of the intervals of size, large power of the So, in fact, so in principle, and related to what I'm saying, it's plausible that now with the tools coming from the second result, we now have the tools to actually sh potentially show that the Riemann hypothesis implies all the human. In fact, one nice thing about this problem is that we kind of know what the ends are. So essentially from the original work of mathematical acid and Dow, we knew that there were three main obstructions to try that stopped us from solving these equivalent checkers that we didn't know how to handle. The tools introduced to study this problem 
actually what they manage is to unconditionally resolve two of these three issues. So there's only one obstruction that we really don't know how to do that has made a manifestation in, in the approach. This is really one phenomenon you know, to stand the other two to be eliminated. In fact, what perhaps was considered the main obstruction is now not to be. So as long as we can handle this last, this third obstruction, and assuming the remnant of hypothesis, so that two things are dealt with unconditionally, and then assuming the remnant hypothesis, we can get rid of the third obstruction at least. Maybe to take away that energy to improve and push to actually solve the change. Now, of course, a, a, a natural objection one may raise is that assuming from the hypothesis block. But in, again, going back to the very complete explanation that I was mentioning during the talk, we have this sort of uh, tension, we have a multiplicative structure, and sort of additional patterns or explanation with probably a certain pattern in which I was looking at. And what we have been really intrigued is what is the connection? How we can actually prove that something is random? How can we prove that this thing is something dependent? So, this is essentially telling us that if one set of story on which we can decide the case of science that we expect when we want it, then we now are starting to have a conceptual understanding of how that can be used to show all these other behaviors, this independence, this uh, correlation explanation of all this sort of more high degree. We're now starting to have the tools, thanks to all the work that we've done like the last 20 years, we say. We now are starting to understand what's the underlying phenomena that allows us to produce this sort of ground. So, corollary, and I put an effort because these things, the results I mentioned are for the poor regime form of conjecture. It should be possible to extend them to the sequence, but that is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. It's not, not it's immediate, but definitely it's there. You know, it's very like difficult to do it. Once one does that, one gets, for example, one application is for the value patterns of the legal function that I mentioned before. I told you that this value patterns we expect them to be two to the k, they call two to the k possible with these value patterns. But we didn't even know until not long ago that there were even k squared patterns. Now we unconditionally know, we have to, that there are these two to the log k squared patterns. So not to expect them. And in fact, assuming the limit hypothesis, we know that there are these two to the kc, so some fixed cost from c. And in principle, maybe you can push it against C to one, which is the, the whole thing. So, I, this, I like this uh, particular example because it really helps illustrate the problem that we went through. That was there. So, we went from fundamental functions, beautiful functions, creating all these fundamental laws that we had been saying for a long time that we didn't have for that growth in this very basic question. Now, for example, assuming if you want to remember all this, before we even assume that, we didn't know how to use it. Now we can guarantee that it's very close to taking all the possible value patterns that we can It's really a very substantial and uh, exciting problem. So then, now uh, finish with a few comments in the group. I want to bring it down with other group goals. I will actually tell you what I really tried to tell you this last few things is more or less what we've done. So the coding that we've done, and directly we can tell you what we do. But so, <clears throat> Basic, basic idea. Suppose the yeah, result we want to prove fail. So we have many short intervals where the Google function actually correlates with sinus function. So this sinus fail, where the Google function multiplied by an exponential with a frequency alpha x. So at the interval of x, we have some frequency alpha x where we will correlate with the function. So what that happens, so we have to then the starting point of all the goals we have for the uniformity in shape is that by the multiplicativity, then the resulting frequencies are not actually independent, but they must satisfy certain relationships. And this has to do with the uh, um, wonderful thing about multiplicative functions that they show some sort of fractality or probability, which is not entirely easy to, <clears throat> to, to explain, but like a very basic version of the phenomenon is if you look at uh, a few consecutive and kind of new functions that will uh, take a certain series of classes. If you multiply those consecutive images by a fixed prime B, you get a magnetic progression of multiple right? And the value pattern that we have here for so multiply the usual function by a prime, the value of the usual function changes by minus one, which gets the prime. So you're going to get the same pattern that we have here over here, but with a sign change. And the same pattern for every class, you get like kind of the same value pattern repeated all across the two states. And what's uh, side point, what's really very nice about uh, all the things that are happening is that 
if you attack this problem from the most elementary viewpoint, you can imagine about the sophisticated maths and you try to do this study as questions. These sort of observations about the pattern of these cartelical things are what you naturally think, well, this is out of information, it should be able to use this to say a lot about the pattern. But we never have been able to actually use that. There is a standard there, no one is not using until now. We started to get tools that actually look like what one naively thinks about this problem. So, anyway, so it's this you get these frequencies in the general law, and you function case and all, and this is exponential, and then this happens to be kind of related to each other. And this is a little bit the starting point of all of those, in my world, the starting point of the observation about them says to the sum of the price that all this information about all, all these frequencies can be encoded in a single overview like Or precisely, we can find a fixed large cost we are number six. Of size for the space square. So we're studying a little function, very intuitive function, and we're going to our x to the x. And it turns out one can build a real number six in kind of far away from this, you know, of size for the space square. And to see the corresponds to a frequency opposite, that in those two elements, six and opposite, you can encapsulate all the information that you care about in the original. So for most of the original intervals, we can find a set of small primes such that if I divide this special element C by those primes, I land close to this. And if I multiply the frequency alpha C by those primes, I like close to one of the frequency that corresponds to the So both physically divided by the primes and in the frequency space is by the primes, you get close simultaneously to the information you have in the individual. So all the information about these uh, intervals from this problem. Can be encapsulated in the program. This is a very rich and particular kind of behavior from some technical perspective. And in fact, <laughs> one can use this information to prove that it is the only possible set of frequencies of lights that satisfy these relations and are those that arise from the functions which they are higher. And one of them has the frequencies corresponding to that, it's not hard to show, and we see the development of the lexical that in fact those are the only counts. Now, this is the basic idea. It's also a lie, but it's just uh, behind the result because it's actually goes back to one three years ago. It's only three months ago in the, the result I mentioned. Because the problem is that the, this process, although it's very nice, perhaps conceptually, is very dedicated and really breaks down as soon as H becomes some, you know, the only words to the original sizes uh, for H is kind of <laughs> but it is intriguing when we can try to push it. And what it turns out is that the frequencies enjoy much more symmetry than one might expect. So there is, uh, they have this uh, relation that I mentioned before that are very clear and have the basis of four authorities. But it turns out that there's much more going on in these frequencies. And in particular, they tend to they have this property where they tend to cluster into small groups of frequencies that satisfy some strong utility problems. So they have a set of frequencies and they back in small groups where you can relate the behavior of say two frequencies here or two frequencies in other group, then automatically all the frequencies in this class will be involved in this cluster. And so the problem I want to create using this again very much for that. And once you have this interesting structure so emerged, then you can actually explore that and make the, the process much more efficient to conserve the information and the process much better. And then you can carry a more robust version of the approach I described before, and naturally succeeds if you are able to spare even for very small interval, which is what we want to do. So finally, why do we need the winner now? Why do we need this right now? So if the primes, the small primes, size h, <coughs> which are the ones that we're using in the approach, behave nicely. Then we can guarantee that for any choice of set, the special element we create, we can indeed have that all the expressions when we divide C by products of primes, then we land close for all elements of the So any element in the big interval x to x can be approximated by something that's called C divided by the product of primes. And so we can touch all of our many of these. The problem is that if primes happen to behave much worse than we expect, particularly don't have to find the reason. It could happen, that any, for any given set, any expression is 
Take it back into the first one. So, how can you say, don't want to leave the fire for the community? It's only to be the world for the more fire. And if it's a good idea, of course, it's going to be fair. It's a good idea that I can. If you want to be speaking, then you don't have to answer the question of the So, if this happens, you don't know. Because it's in practice, what we need is weaker than we are considering in particular. Wow. If this actually happened, then that would be an issue. But as it turns out, essentially all the problems that all the things that we're missing by now, all the useful things are going to be. And that's what we really want to talk about here today. And talk is that we have all these practical problems from different ways, problems, challenges, that we talk in the land of systems and all these things, but take different forms that we have spent for a long time. And now we can more or less reduce these things to very concrete, sort of physical, much more theoretical and even statements. It really are happening like in a typical side of the story. If you can be where the flows of France with the PCB laws and so on. So you can really improve dramatically at the time. So you can reduce all these beautiful questions from the process to very precise, concrete, even statements. So what it remains is to after that. Yeah, and rule out the, the possibility of this hyperactive infection, or perhaps we will take the advantage of it, because it would be a rather more effective So, as I was saying, we, we get all these facts wrong, but this is a very concrete question that looks much more uh, reasonable to attack. So, that, that makes it really a very exciting thing. It's very exciting now to be working at the moment before getting into this. Thank you.